Hi everyone, it's me again, Doris Raymond from The Way We Wore in Los Angeles, and I have the great privilege of being uh, next to Stephen Porterfield, who is the proprietor of Cat's Meow in Midland, Texas. But not only is he that, but he is the expert for fashion on the Antique Roadshow. So I want to welcome you to our show. Thank you, Doris. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, Stephen and I go back a long time, like over 20 years. Yes, over 20. Actually, the first time we actually talked to each other on the phone was when someone put us together because you were looking for gowns for the Titanic. And uh, they said, this guy in Texas will have them. Totally forgot about that. So anyway, so actually we got together on the phone and I sent you three French couture gowns to pick from. Wow. And you bought all of them, if I remember correctly. Wow, and look at us. Here we are several decades later. <laughs> still, I'm still dragging things. <laughs> I'm still buying. <laughs> so, yeah, and we are here today because um, Mike suggested doing an episode on fashion dolls. And I really like the idea because dolls have had an impact on fashion for centuries, which I did not know. And since I have no knowledge about uh, fashion dolls, I thought, why not talk to someone who collects? I love collecting, and there is so much to know about dolls. I actually have over 18 French fashion dolls from the 1860s to the early 1900s. And wow. Anyway, and their accessories, there are more than... 600 different companies that made items in Paris for French fashion dolls during its heyday. Wow. So it is, it's a, you can, you can collect them as anything, having to do everything from furniture to, to hair combs and jewelry and couture clothing for them. Amazing. Fashion dolls are, were in existence from the 1300s uh, through the 1800s and uh, they became in the, um, 1300s, I believe, they became a symbol of um, wealth and were part of the royal, um, royal families would give them as gifts and they were considered extremely precious. But my understanding is that dolls were used because print wasn't that in, in existence and how do you exhibit what the fashions are of the time uh, and it was a way to, for, for dressmakers as well as uh, people to kind of get um, up to speed with what was happening. Is that what your understanding is? Yes, I actually read, it was an article, like, it was an American article that some of the fashion dolls had come over in the 1870s and they, they had a women's party where they all came to the home and designers came to the home and actually looked at the dolls and made notes and, and things like that. So they were a, they were a vi viable way to show fashion. Um, and so much of uh, the trends, like hairstyles as well as accessories, were exhibited in on these um, wonderful creations. Well, they were, and actually, it every undergarment they created, everything that they would have worn as a woman on those dolls, every single thing, every amazing. Item. And and the first dolls were much larger than the ones that we have today. Mm -hmm. Typically, how how large were they? Well, you see a lot that were like 30 inches tall, 36 oh, wow. inches uh -huh. tall. So they That's were big. Not, yes. They were not s small dolls, you know. And, of course, they went down to, to smaller sizes. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the earlier ones were good size. and um, Easier to make the clothing for as yes. well. Yeah. The tinier the doll, the harder to actually create an authentic, you know, structured piece. I can't imagine making a corset small enough for that girl. Well, I have some. I can only, <laughs> I want to see them next time I visit okay. you. Um, I wanted to also mention that um, France was um, a big deal in terms of uh, fashion dolls. And uh, that there, there's a term that I didn't realize, which is Pandora. Can you explain what that is? Most people think of Pandora's box, and that's not what we're referring to. Well, the Pandora was actually the model that actually would travel from the countries. And anyway, some of them were as large as life size, I have mm. heard. And so they would, uh, they, would, they would create this sumptuous. These were like 
the finest, what we would call couture today, mm -hmm. but the finest craftsmanship, the most beautiful embroidery, the most fabulous lace, everything would be so mm -hmm. sumptuous. It would, it was like receiving, it was like receiving a treasure. I read that during the first half of the 19th century, uh, fashion dolls were used, obviously, to display fashion, but that um, it wasn't until the 1850s when Charles Frederick Worth started to use live models. And so that began the uh, receding of using dolls for fashion. I think so. And also, it changed in those period of that period of time. Fashion dolls became a huge, um, they became a huge item for children to play with. And it was an educational tool because you would, mm -hmm. you could buy a doll in just its chemise or you could buy it completely dressed. And even some of the couture house, there are records of them making clothing for, for dolls. And so you Great. get all levels. A lot of times it was the mothers or grandmothers that would create it. But it, it was done in a way so that the children would not only learn how to dress themselves properly, the little girls, but they would begin sewing their own clothes for their dolls. And so when you collect dolls, you see everything from exquisite, incredibly well-made, to very primitively made that were probably made by the hands of children. And they're all treasures. That's great. Um, you brought a really spectacular fashion doll from the 1860s. Can you talk about that? Well, this one actually is a P Parisian doll. She's not marked, but I believe she is made by Gautier. She has the most beautiful hand-blown eyes. What's wonderful about her is she has her complete original ensemble down to her shoes. It's incredible to look at this, to look at the teeny tiny straw that is concentric, very tiny at the top, and then it gets a little bit bigger towards the brim. But to look at the, how tiny the lace is, how tiny the gloves are, the fingers... Everything is made in scale, and and anyway, this gown is is particularly lovely, and it's in good, really good shape for being a hundred and fifty or sixty years old. And anyway, um, this is her original wig, even. Wow! So it's unusual to find them where you know for sure that the clothing on them was the clothing that they came in, because a lot of them were redressed multiple times as they passed down through the families. Because the fashion doll became popular first with the China dolls in mm. the 1840s and 50s, and then into the French fashion dolls, which became the height of fashion. And, the, and they're some of the most collectible and the most expensive dolls in today's market. You were saying that some of the pieces, like um, the corsets, for example, each individual, this doll has like layers of underpinnings. It, it's really remarkable to look at. Um, but you were saying that all told, with all the accessories and everything, the fat doll is worth probably over $5,000. In, in the four to $5,000 range, mm -hmm. because she's completely original. That makes, you can double the price on a doll if it has, you know, completely original clothing. Mm -hmm. so, Amazing. That's so great. And um, as we progress more towards the uh, 20th century, um, you brought some other examples, which I think are fantastic. But before we get to those, I want to mention that um, dolls have such an important part in the history of the world, sociologically, right? Um, and France was devastated by World War II, and Nina Ricci's son came up with this idea of uh, culling 15 people, French um, artisans, designers, to create these um, one-third scale dolls. And they created this traveling show called Théâtre de la Mode. Um, can you talk about that? Oh, it was a fascinating. A fasc it's, the costumes for the garments are insanely beautiful. They are amazing. And, it's, and it ended its... Uh, production here are its uh, not production but its exhibitions here in America and anywhere, in San Francisco in San Francisco that's yeah. right and so it traveled the world and people could see the and the clothing was made to represent different periods of time and it was insanely done and beautifully done I can't remember the height of the dolls but I think it was it was one-third scale and what I read was that um, designers like Schiaparelli, 
Uh, Lucien Lelong uh, contributed to it, and at that time, Christian Dior worked for Lelong, so they believed that the doll that was, um, that the clothing that was created by Lelong was actually created by Dior, although they're not 100% sure. But um, they said Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpel made gems for the dolls, and everything was to scale. And when you think about reviving the couture industry after the war, what better way to get people excited? But people really crammed into these exhibitions. Yes, that, it was a sensation. It was. It was a sensation. People, long lines of people to see the exhibitions. And because they were so glamorous and so amazing, they got tons of publicity. So everybody around the country knew that this was coming and when it would come to their area. So they would travel to see this exhibition. And, and the, the irony, I guess, about it is after it ended uh, at, I think it was the city of Paris in San Francisco, it was basically put in the basement and forgotten until the 80s when someone uncovered it. And this wonderful museum in Washington State called the Mary Hill Museum acquired them. So if you're ever in the Mary Hill area of Washington State, you should Try to make an appointment to go see. Uh, they do a rotating exhibition of the dolls and the scenic designs that were done by very important artists of the time. Yes. So um, I, I have actually two books on Théâtre de la Mode. Uh, it was at the Diang Museum, so I, um, I'm very happy that I have this book, but then this large hardcover book also to look at these images, and Mike will definitely include some of them in, in um, this episode. It's to see the couture work on these miniatures. It's just gorgeous. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing to see what they did mm -hmm. in such a tiny scale. So, but that brings us up to the doll that changed the face of dolls, and that is... The Barbie doll. The Barbie is what brought the grown-up woman back onto the scene. Now, her figure is, is not in proportion at all. to Controversial. <laughs> I mean, it was controversial. But the doll itself, I can't remember, but it's a crazy, crazy. Like, if you made a body today, just like the Barbie body, her bust would be like 58 or 60, and her waist like 18 or 20 inches. Oh, ouch. So it, it's, not, <laughs> it's not really representative of what a woman's figure is. But it was so fun, and, and Mattel created the most amazing clothes to go along with it. And even then, the first garments, there were three that were designed by French, you know, French designers. I didn't know and that. Anyway, those garments today sell in the neighborhood of 1,000 to 1,500, for, if you get wow. the complete ensemble. And you brought a Barbie with you. Yes, I brought a number three Barbie with me, which uh, number one and two are the most collectible. And the big difference in them is the eye color. There is no blue in the iris of the eyes. It's just black and white. And they have very arched eyebrows, and they look a little wicked if you look at them. And anyway, uh, the number three added blue color. Now, this was all done in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And anyway, the blue adds a more warmth to the doll's expression. And anyway, uh, and is what the number three wearing uh, the original? She's a, that black and white bathing suit. All of the Barbies from Barbie one to f the ponytails had that striped bathing suit to one to five. Or I don't know if the six still had the the black and white, but there were six different variations of the ponytail. So. Wow. And fashion wise, did Barbie have an impact? I mean, we can talk about the impact that it's having now, like with uh, Balmain and uh, obviously Moschino, but um, back in the day, in the 50s, when she was first introduced, did she have an impact on fashion? She had an impact because little girls wanted to look like her, mm -hmm. and that's more the impact she had on fashion. They wanted to mimic her look, you know, when they grew up. They wanted to be that pristine, um, beautiful, high-fashion creature. Mm -hmm. And so I think it had, I don't think she was she was copying the latest fashions, and she was showing the latest fashions. Every year there was a new group of dresses that came out. So Mattel yeah. kept right on top of fashion trends. And so, in a way, she was showing the young girls how to dress. Interesting. You know. And uh, since I brought up you know, the most recent collection at 
Balmain was a limited edition, um, genderless, they called it, um, Barbie. And it mostly it's different variations of the color pink. And many of the pieces in that collection are completely sold out. But you see how even, what, 70 years after the fact, Barbie's uh, impact still is felt. It's, it's really the, also the, the people that are driving the market are not children on the Barbies right. now. They're actually adults. I mean, children still play with them. Those, those Barbies are sold at Walmart and places like that. But all of the big stores carry these incredibly beautiful, you know, Barbies that are designed by the, all the latest designers. Bob Mackey, they have Calvin Klein. Mm -hmm. You can get you can get Ralph Lauren Barbies. You know, you get all of these that their their ensembles are insane and and the value is quite a bit more or the cost is quite a bit more than just a regular Barbie you would buy for a child. I remember seeing an, uh, a, a Vogue, I believe from uh, 2014, where Vogue did a whole thing for Christmas concepts and there were different designers like Ralph Lauren and, and Fendi and, and they all had capsulated, there was a live model wearing clothing that they envisioned would be Barbies, but with all these accessories as well. So, you know, when you look at uh, a pers personality like Barbie. Um, Moschino did an amazing runway show in 2014 uh, for spring 2015 and I, I just feel like she's going to be with us I think forever. I think so too. I, I was just at FITM, you know, downtown Los Angeles and if you go through their galleries or on the second floor where the museum office is, there's an entire um, entire wall of Barbies and who designed the clothing for them. And there's, they even run a runway show sometimes when you're in there. So you can see the adult version of those clothing going across the, the stage. So I think Barbie's here for good. <laughs> and then talking about um, fashion icons like ba Barbie, we have Princess Di. Yes, this is a, I brought a Princess Di doll. And you can get all kinds of amazing wardrobe. And they've actually copied mm. dresses that she wore. So, you know, you can actually get, and they even create the jewels to match everything she wore at a party or if she went to a ball, you could actually buy that ensemble. Wow. Oh, Stephen, I'm so, thank you so much for bringing your pieces and for sharing your knowledge on uh, something that you're very passionate about. I appreciate it. It's something I had no, no knowledge of, so thank you. Well, you're welcome. I love learning. I mean, and I think of all the years that I've sold to you and how much I've learned simply because you said, you know, I, I, I want you to look for this designer or that designer. And you, when you start studying and you start finding out details, I mean, I think we're never too old to learn. Absolutely. I, I, and this has been quite a, a fabulous learning experience. I know we veered off the track of fashion the way we've been presenting it, but I love the fact that fashion translates into so much of our lives. And, you know, most of us grew up with dolls. And uh, I know that I got smitten with fashion because I made clothes for my dolls. And, you know, the seed was planted back then. So hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. And um, if you did, give us a thumbs up. And if you have any comments, we look forward to reading them. Um, and if you haven't subscribed, there is a subscription button, so please do so, because we love growing our community. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next time, and uh, thank you very much, Stephen. You're welcome. Until next time, bye.